Good afternoon from Miami Beach, the home of the Neurosurgical TV Studios. Today we have, we're lucky to have a med student from Cameroon, I believe he's fifth year, uh, Zolo Ivan. He's going to be talking about acute hydrocephalus and we're going to be followed by a few more presentations. Let's first introduce the panel. Hello, Marco, welcome. Hello, Ni. Uh, okay, uh, the audio is here. Uh, I'm a consultant neurosurgeon in uh, Gravenona, north part of Italy. Good. Welcome, a frequent contributor to this channel. Welcome, Marlo. And Kelvin, welcome. Please introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Dr. Bennett. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm Kelvin Nemaire from Zimbabwe, a consultant neurosurgeon, currently a fellow in Skalbes. Uh, 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 majoring in uh, neurovascular and neuro-oncology in Turkey. Very, very welcome, uh, Kel Kelvin. And maybe we can hear s of what your experience is in Turkey in a formal presentation. Uh, That's and a also a friend of Dr. Kabulo, who is going to be presenting in a couple of hours. So, okay, Zolo, uh, welcome and thanks for accepting the challenge. Uh, and it's all yours. Okay, Zolo, you're muted there. Sorry. All right. Is it better now? Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yes. All right. I'm Zolo Ivan, a CTA medical student from the University of Boya in Cameroon. I am a member of the, of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons, and uh, I'll be the one to present today. So thank you very much for being there for, to everybody, and uh, to join, we can proceed. Okay, let me sh share the screen. There we go. Okay. All right. So uh, the lecture of today is Acute Hydrocephalus, uh, presented by Zolo Ivan, me, a member of Association of Future African Neurosurgeon, musical student from the Faculty of Health Sciences University of Boya in Cameroon. So next slide, Otto. Okay. I'm trying to use my keyboard, <laughs> it's not working. Okay, Hola. there we go. Okay, so you are going to follow this plan. You are going to have a, an introduction. You are going to speak about epidemiology. Then you are going to uh, look at the pathophysiology. And then uh, we shall see how to make the di a diagnosis and uh, the management. Then you are going to speak about the prognosis and uh, you are going to have a summary and I will give you my references. Next slide. Yes, yeah, doctor. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, the term hydrocephalus is derived from two words, hydro meaning water and the cephalus referring to the head. So hydrocephalus is a condition in which excess cerebros vascu um, I mean cerebro ce cerebrospinal fluid bursts bursts in uh, up within the ventricles uh, of the brain and they may increase the pressure within the head. So uh, CSF has three crucial functions. The first thing is it acts as a shock absorber for the brain and the spinal cord. The second one, it, it acts as a vehicle for delivering nutrients to the brain and removing waste. And then the last one is uh, it flows between the uh, cranium and the spine to regulate the changes in the pressure within the brain. Next slide, doctor. So here we have uh, um, a, two diagrams. One is showing us the, the ventricular system, the, the, the different ventricles. We have the uh, lateral ventricles, we have the, uh, uh, um, the third ventricle, we have the foot ventricle, and we have the different connection between them. So and the, on the second one, we have um, the pathway of uh, the CSF flow. So we see it moves from uh, where it is being produced and circulates through the different uh, ventricles and passing through the different foramina. And uh, it is very important for us to uh, have this in mind because if you need to understand what hydrocephalus is all about, you are going to you, you will need to understand this uh, circulation and uh, all this uh, uh, physiology. Next slide, Dr. Dr. Ben. So here again is another uh, another diagram uh, summarizing the um, production and circulation of the CSF through the uh, through the through the ventricular system. Next slide, Dr. Jen. So, uh, 
hydrocephalus may be caused by impaired CSF flu, impaired CSF reabsorption, or excessive CSF production. So in uh, obs uh, absorption to the CSF flu hinders uh, its free passage through the ventricular system and subarachnoid space. Uh, those and, and this can cause an increase in the intracranial pressure. So um, hydrocephalus can also be caused by overproduction of CSF, that is from the choroid plexus, um, due to maybe a papilloma, a villous uh, uh, hypertrophy. Next slide, doctor. Hydrocephalus can be congenital or acquired later in life. So associated, it can also be associated with birth defects, including neural uh, tube defects and, um, and those that result in the aqueduct stenosis. So causes of acquired hydrocephalus include infections, we have brain tumors, we have traumatic brain injuries, we have intracranial hemorrhages, and uh, acute hydrocephalus occurs over days, while subacute hydrocephalus occurs over weeks, and chronic hydrocephalus occurs over months. Next slide, please. Based on its underlying mechanism, hydrocephalus can be classified into communicating, non-communicating, normal pressure hydrocephalus, and a benign external hydrocephalus. And it is important to note here that cerebral atrophy, uh, focal destructive lesions uh, lead to, inc to CSF inc uh, increase in the C uh, on the central nervous system, but uh, they are not uh, classified as uh, hydrocephalus. They have a different uh, 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 subset. Next slide, please. So, so uh, now let us have let us try to see the different uh, the different types that we have mentioned in the previous slide. So communicating hydroca communicating hydrocephalus or non-obstructive hydrocephalus occurs as a result of either overproduction of the CSF, uh, defective reabsorption uh, of the CSF as a result of damage to arachnoid uh, granulation, or venous drainage insufficiency, and this causes uh, 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 diffuse ventricular dilatation. So. In the non-communicating um, hydrocephalus, which, is, which, can also be called, which can also be called obstructive hydrocephalus, it occur, uh, here we see um, CSF flow is obstructed within the ventricular system or in its outlets to the uh, arachnoid space. And this results in impairment of the CSF flow from ventricular uh, to the arachnoid space. So in the, in the diagrams I show you in the beginning, in the beginning of, the, of the presentation, you saw the, 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 the pattern the CSF flow. So, if there's any disruption here, uh, um, if there's a problem at the level of uh, the outlets, then we speak about uh, uh, non communicating uh, hydrocephalus. If there's obstruction there, we speak about non communicating hydrocephalus because there's actually a lack of communication between the ventricular system, which is like actually a pipe. So, if there's any problem at the, any level in the pipe, like for example, an, an obstruction, then we, then we speak about non-communicating hydrocephalus because the, the ventricular system is not communicating like this, an obstruct space like a, a, a barrage. That's why it's also called obstructive hydrocephalus. So it is mostly seen in a intraventricular or extraventricular mass occupying lesions. And, uh, uh, and, uh, if this, and these lesions, uh, uh, it is present when these lesions apply pressure on the ventricular system. That is when you can have also have some sort of obstructive hydrocephalus. If the uh, foramen of, of, of mon, I mean, foramen of mono obstruction may lead to the uh, di dilation of one or in large enough those uh, both lateral ventricles. So if there's an obstruction level of the foramen of mono Given that it is a kind of a communication with the, uh, the spinal cord, there's going to be dilatation of, first of all, the, uh, the, 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 the ventricles that are, that are immediately after it. So we are going to have the, the dilatation of the different ventricles, and that's how it's going to go uh, backward. So the aqueduct of Sylvius is normally narrow, but may be obstructed by a number of genetic or acquired lesions. And lead to dilatation of both lateral ventricles as well as the third ventricle. So, a fourth ventricle obstruction leads to dilatation of the aqueduct as well as the lateral and third ventricle. This is seen mainly in a, a, a chari malfunction. The foramen of Lushka and the foramen 
of uh, emergency may be obstructed due to congenital malformation. And this is being seen, uh, in, for example, in dandy world dandy malformation. Next slide, doctor, please. Dr. John. Okay. So, uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus is a form of a chronic communicating hydrocephalus and, is and it rarely occurs in patients younger than 60 years. It is uh, so called because of enlarged ventricles and intermittent increase but often normal CSF pressure, that does the name normal pressure hydrocephalus. And uh, at, uh, at night, there might be some intermittent elevation of intracranial pressure in some individuals. And it is characterized by a triad of symptoms, which is a, a dementia, apraxia gate, and the urinary incontinence. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, doctor. Okay. So, uh, benign external, another form of uh, hydrocephalus that we mentioned in the beginning, benign external hydrocephalus is. Um, defined as benign enlargement of subarachnoid space in infants. It is a self-limiting CSF uh, uh, absorption deficiency leading to some dil dilatation of subarachnoid spaces, raised intracranial pressure with mild to moderate ventric ventricles dilatation, though sometimes they, uh, they might be uh, normal. And uh, this is a type of communicating, uh, com communicating hydrocephalus and most often resolved by the age of one year. So, that's why it can also be called a P9. Next slide, doctor. So, congenital hydrocephalus, as the name implies, is present in the uh, in infants prior to birth. And the, the most common cause of congenital hydrocephalus is aqueduct, aqu aqueductal stenosis. Other causes include neural tube defect, arachnoid cyst, dandy Walker syndrome, and the Arnold Shari malformation. In newborns and toddlers, with hydrocephalus, the head circumference is enlarged rapidly and uh, soon surpasses the 97th percentile. That's when you can now uh, call it a, some sort of enlargement of the head compared to the, uh, the normal population. And since the skull bones have not yet firmly joined together, bulging, bulging, firm anterior and the posterior fontanelle may be present even when the uh, person is in an upright position. And, about, and in about 80 to 90 percent of infants with spinal bifida, uh, uh, they, 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 they develop hydrocephalus. Next slide, please, Doctor. About, uh, so now, I think we are speaking about the uh, epidemiology. So about one to uh, one to two in every 1,000 newborns have a hydrocephalus. And the rates in the developing world may be higher. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is estimated to affect about five to five per 100,000 people with rates increasing with age. The, uh, the pool incidence of congenital hydrocephalus is highest in Africa and Latin America and lowest in the United States and uh, Canada. And uh, the incidence is higher in low and middle income countries than in high and in, that, than in high income countries. And those are the values or those are the uh, the, the, the estimation. So while likely representing an underestimate, an, an underestimate each year, nearly 400,000 new cases of pediatric hydrocephalus will develop worldwide. Next slide, please. John? Oh, I'm sorry. The greatest burden of disease falls uh, on the African, Latin American, and the Southeast Asian uh, regions, accounting for three quarters of the total volume of new cases. The high crude birth rate, great, uh, greater portion of parents with uh, post infectious etiology, and higher incidence of um, neural tube defects all contribute to a case volume in low and middle income countries that outweighs that in high income countries by more than 20 fold. Global estimate of uh, adult and other forms of acquired hydrocephalus are lacking. So a, a global effort to address hydrocephalus in regions with the greatest demand is imperative to reduce disease incidence, morbidity, mortality, and disparities of access to treatment. Please, next slide, Doctor. Okay. 
incidence uh, incidence is same in male and female unless for uh, Bickers Adam syndrome which is an X-linked uh, hydrocephalus which is an X-linked hydrocephalus with aqueductal with aqueduct aqueduct of sorry aqueduct aqueduct of serious stenosis having male predominance and, uh, and has a male predominance is an so normal pressure hydrocephalus also has a slight male predominance and hydrocephalus has a bimodal age curve. One peak occurs in infancy with various causes and the other one in adulthood. Adult uh, hydrocephalus represents 40% of uh, total case of hydrocephalus. Next slide, please. So hydrocephalus triples or the subarachnoid space. In a person without hydrocephalus, CSF continuously circulates through its uh, ventricles and the spinal cord and is uh, continuously drained away into the circulatory system. So alternatively, the condition may be uh, the condition may result from an overproduction of CSF. So we can either have a, a problem with the uh, obstruction or we have a problem with the uh, overproduction of uh, CSF. So um, from a congenital, uh, uh, I mean, we can have a problem. You can have uh, hydrocephalus can occur as a result of overproduction, and from a congenital um, and from a congenital malformation, blocking normal drainage of this uh, of the of the fluid. I mean, normal flow and normal drainage of the fluid, or the, uh, or from complication of head injury or infections. So, for example, in somebody having uh, um, a meningitis, there can be some. Uh, um, problems with the arachnoid, uh, arachnoid villus so the hydrocephalus is not going to be properly reabsorbed. And also uh, some sequelae of the infection can lead to some sort of stenosis of the different uh, uh, passage through which uh, CSF will pass. So this can, all this can contribute into uh, causing hydrocephalus. Next slide, Dr. John, please. Okay, so compensatory mechanisms may occur through trans, uh, transventricular absorption of CSF and absorption or uh, an absorption along nerve root sleeves, resulting in enlargement of the optic nerve sheet. It, this is this this is important to understand because all this will some will somehow determine what you are going to observe in the uh, in the like the clinical presentation of the patient. So the temporal and the frontal horns dilate. The temporal and the frontal horns of the uh, ventricles dilate first, and the, it's usually asymmetrical. This may result in a, uh, this may result in elevation of corpus cal callosum, stretching, stretching, and eventually perforation of the septum pellucidum, tying of the tying of the cerebral mantle or enlargement of the third ventricles downward into sorry into the pituitary fossa, thus causing pituitary dysfunction. And also, there's some sort of dorsal, uh, the, the dorsal midbrain compression leads to Parino syndrome, which is uh, characterized by paralysis of the of of of, of obvious pseudo Aguil Robertson pupils convergence or convergence retraction nystagmus, and there's a uh, eyelid retraction, thus uh, leading to some sort of setting sun sign. This is like some sort of like hallmark of hydrocephalus in children. Next slide, doctor. So compression of the brain tissue by accumulating fluid and the skull eventually cause, uh, cause uh, neurological symptoms such as convulsion, intellectual uh, disability, and a, epileptic seizures observed in hydrocephalus. These signs occur sooner in adults. And the fetuses, uh, fetuses infants, and young, and young children with hydrocephalus typically have an, abnorm an abnormally large head, excluding the face because of the pressure of the um, fluid cause because of the pressure that the fluid causes, uh, the, which, which causes the individual uh, skull bones to, uh, to bulge outwards and, uh, and at their uh, juncture points. So it's obvious that given that in children, the brain is not, the sutures are not yet uh, uh, well formed. So if there is some sort of increase in pressure from within, this is going to cause an outward bulge of the, uh, of the, um, the different bones of the skull. Next slide, doctor. The elevated uh, intracranial pressure may cause compression of the brain, leading to brain damage and other complications. 
if the foramina uh, of the fourth ventricle or the cerebral aqueduct are blocked, CSF can accumulate within the ventricles. This condition is called internal hydrocephalus and it, and it results in increased CSF pressure. The production of CSF continues even when the passage that normally allow it to exit the brain are, uh, are blocked. So this will lead to fluid that builds with, uh, inside the brain, causing pressure that dilates the ventricle and compresses the, nerve, uh, the, ne the nervous tissue. Next slide, doctor. Compression of the uh, nervous tissue usually result in irreversible brain damage. If the skull bones are not completely ossified, as we already mentioned, when the hydrocephalus occurs, the pressure may also severely enlarge the head, as we see in the, uh, in the, the image that is just beside. And the cerebral aqueduct may be blocked at the time of birth or may become blocked later in life because, uh, because of tumor growing in the brain stem. So it can be acquired or it can be congenital. Please, next slide, doctor. This is an image of uh, uh, um, the, the ventricular system. You see how it's been di how it's dilated, and uh, this side is the sun setting eyes uh, in a child with hydrocephalus. I also see how the head is severely enlarged. Next slide, please, doctor. So, having uh, uh, seen the uh, the pathophysiology of hydrocephalus, let us now speak about the clinical presentation of the patient. So, if, how how will they present? and uh, what determines the presentation of the patient. So the presentation of the patient is determined by one, the age of the, the patient's age. It's clear that if uh, there's a hydrocephalus in a child, uh, like maybe an infant with whom, in whom the, 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 the sutures have, the, suture of the, the, the sutures are not yet well formed, is going to be, the presentation is going to be different from uh, hydrocephalus occurring in an adult where the sutures have already been consolidated and, and, and well formed. So it depends on the, the patient's age, the underlying cause of the hydrocephalus, the location of the obstruction, the duration, and the uh, rapidity of onset. And the symptoms in infant include poor feeding, irritability, reduced activity, vomiting. Next slide, please, doctor. Next slide. Uh, Can you so see that? Symptoms, we have already seen the symptoms in. Is this the right slide, uh, Solo? Uh, I think in fast, now let us see symptoms in the, of the mental capacity so leading to some. No, no. Can you just go back, backward? Uh, uh, you want to go, I'm sorry, you want to go back a slide? Yes, one slide back. Okay. That's... No, you went forward. Okay, as usual. Use the keyboard. I'm not used to this platform. Uh, I'm, I'm going back forward. There's no option no. to go backwards. Uh, use, use the keyboard, the keyboard. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'll tr oh, the, I'm, you're right. You're right. Okay. Good. Tell me when. Good. Is this yes. it? Yes. Yes, this is a slide. Good. Okay. So we said that there's, there's going to be slowing of the mental capacity in children. There's going to be headaches, especially in the morning. There's going to be a neck pain. There's going to be vomiting. There's going to be blood vision, double vision, stunted growth. Sorry, there's a problem with the spelling. A precocious puberty, a spas, spas, spasticity, and... Next slide. The leading to I'm sorry, I have an audio. Did you say next slide? Uh, yes, next slide. Okay, there we go. I, I'm i just having trouble hearing you sometimes. All right, all right. And, and I just want to, I also want to apologize to... Uh, the, the, the... No, we appreciate you making the effort. Thank you. Listen to your presentation. Actually, there is one point no problem. PowerPoint and yes, okay, good. There's a message from Ulrich. Okay, so uh, in adults, the symptoms in adults include uh, cognitive deterioration, headaches, uh, neck pain. There's nausea, vomiting, blood vision, double vision, difficulty in walking, drowsiness, and incontinence. Next slide, please. 
So uh, the physical findings in infants include head enlargement, as we already explained, uh, disjunction of sutures, dilated scalp veins, uh, tense fontanelles, certain sun uh, sign, increased limb tone, papilledema, failure of upward gaze, uh, marine sign, which is a trackpot uh, sound noted on the percussion of the head in children, and the uh, unilateral or bilateral uh, seat cranial nerve palsy. Next slide, Dr. Okay. So the physical findings in adult include, as we already said, a, a, a papilledema, failure of upward gaze, and the accommodation in, I mean, accommodation indicate, indicating pressure on the tectile plate. There's also on steady gait, there is large head if it, uh, if it is since a childhood that that is if the uh, hydrocephalus is present since childhood, there's going to be an enlargement in the head in children. And uh, there's going to be in, uh, the physical presentation in normal pressure hydrocephalus are increased reflexes. Uh, I think that the, the, Dr. Kabul is going to better explain this. There is a difficulty working and there's the, 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 the presence of uh, primitive uh, reflexes. Next slide, please. So, uh, to make the diagnosis of hydrocephalus, you first of all uh, have to do a, 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 a good uh, um, anamnesis. So after an, 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 an anamnesis and physical examination, some uh, workup might be requested to confirm the diagnosis and uh, rule out differential as well as evaluate the extent of damage. So uh, some the laboratory investigation you will need to do a genetic testing in case of uh, suspecting x being hydrocephalus, as we explained earlier, CSF, uh, um, Treat evaluation in post hemorrhagic and post uh, meningitis hydrocephalus, screening of the mother in case of a congenital hydrocephalus. If uh, you see the, for example, the gem, the gem that, are, uh, that, that will have caused the, 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 the hydrocephalus. Next slide, Dr. John. Next slide. Is that diagnosis? Yes, next slide, Doctor. Yeah, it's not, okay, it's not going forward. There we go. Okay, so, uh, so we have already spoken about the, the laboratory investigation that we can do for that. So let, now let us now see the imaging studies you can do. So you, you, you should do a CT scan, that is to see the size of the ventricles. You should do uh, an MRI. You should do, and the criteria uh, that uh, will help you to, to define if it is a hydrocephalus or not on the CT scan or the MRI are the sizes, the, I mean the size of both temporal horn, that is, it should be greater than the two millimeters. And uh, you should note that the temporal horns uh, are not clearly seen in absence of hydrocephalus. So the ratio of, the, the other criteria that we should use is the ratio of uh, largest width of frontal horns to, max, uh, to uh, maximal uh, by, by parietal diameter. And uh, the, if it is greater than 30%, you have a case of hydrocephalus. We also use a trans, uh, Transependymal exudate in translated on, I mean, transependymal exudate is translated on images as a proventriculus, proventriculus hypoattenuation or a, a super, super intending on the, uh, based on the, if you are if, uh, seen on the CT and the, the MRI. And also, there's going to be ballooning of the frontal horns of lateral and, and third ventricles, that is called the Mickey Mouse a, a ventricle, the penis. And it is indicating aqueduct obstruction. You can also have upward bowing of the corpus callosum. So if you have all these, uh, um, all these five, uh, uh, um, five uh, indications, then, then it is most relative of the hydrocephalus. Next slide, Dr. John. And now to determine if it is a chronic hydrocephalus, you, have, you, have, you are going to have a temporal horns that may be less prominent than an acute hydrocephalus. Also have third ventricle. Uh, uh, I mean, third ventricle may the third ventricle may terminate. I mean, may herniate into the cellular tussica. The cellular tussica may be eroded. Then you might also have a mac macrophenia, and uh, you have a corpus. The corpus callosum may be uh, atrophied. That is in X and Vaco. As I said, this is the type of hydrocephalus uh, uh, where there is some sort of atrophy and the the CSF fuse is the, the, the space that is being left, and so it's not really it's not really a hydrocephalus, but some some consider it as being a, a form of hydrocephalus. Next slide, Dr. John. So on ultrasound, 
uh, through anterior fontanel to yeah, you do through anterior fontanel to evaluate the subependymal and the intraventricular hemorrhages and possible development of a progressive hydrocephalus. Also do we also do hydronuclide uh, systemography. You can also do a, a, a skull radiography and a, a, can also use an EEG and a lumbar puncture, next slide So now that now that you have already seen uh, the different uh, presentation on how to make a diagnosis of hydrocephalus, let, let us now look, let us now have an idea about the, the, the management of the hydrocephalus. So we can have different uh, 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 groups of management. We can have a medical care and uh, um, yeah, this care compared to the surgical care is just used to delay the surgical care. So this is not the best management, but sometimes we can use it, we can give the patient some medical care. So as we say, it is used to delay the surgical care, which is the most and the, the mainstay of management of hydrocephalus. And uh, yeah, normal CSA physio physiology may resume during this period of care, thus avoiding surgical intervention. So you can have a patient having, uh, I mean, the, the, the hydrocephalus will resolve and everything, everything will go back to normal you, when giving the medical care to the patient. But it is not effective for long-term management of chronic hydrocephalus, and it may include a metabolic side effects, and uh, those should only be used temporarily. The drugs used here work with a different mechanism to alleviate the hydrocephalus. Next slide, Dr. John. So in the medical care, um, the drugs that you give to the patient work by different mechanisms to regulate the CSF dynamics as follows. So there's either going to be decreased CSF secretion by the correct plexus, and the drugs that do that that are responsible for this, we have acetazolamide and the lozimide. And you can also increase a CSF reabsorption, and the one mainly used here is uh, isosorbide. Do there's some sort of... Uh, uh, um, some sort of worry concerning this. Okay, so acetazolamide uh, uh, can be used alone or in synergy with cyclosamide, and it's mainly used in post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus in units. So it is a, a, a it is a non-competitive reversal inhibitor of uh, carbonic anhydrase, which leads to decreased CSF secretion by the correct plexus. Rosemite lowers the sodium uptake, affecting water uh, transport into the cells by inhibiting cellular membrane cation uh, chloride form as well as inhibiting the carbonic anhydrase uh, 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 in the next slide, doctor. So having seen on the medical care, which I repeat is not the, uh, the, the appropriate care for hydrocephalus, for hydrocephal, it's just a measure to delay, uh, it's just a measure that we can use if there's a problem uh, uh, for a patient to have access to surgical care. The main treatment for hydrocephalus depending on the type also is surgical care. So what is what is in the surgical care? This is, as I say, is a preferred therapeutic option over medical care. And it includes, you can do a lumbar puncture, you can do a correct place with uh, a fertilization, you can do a, a, a shunting, you have opening of stenosis, I mean, to enlarge the, 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 the stenosis, you have removal of tumor compressing uh, the ventricular system, as I explained earlier, if, can also have hydrocephalus due to an external obstruction because you also have uh, endoscopic fenestration of the third ventricle as a surgical measure. We have a ventricular tap, we have open ventricular drainage, and each technique has advantages and disadvantages. Thus, a balance of two should uh, of a balance of the two, the advantages and the disadvantages, should be made before using the, 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 the any of the techniques. Excellent, Dr. John. So let us see a, a, a lumbar puncture. So it is useful only in cases of communicating hydrocephalus. So you should first of all make sure that the patient has a communicating hydrocephalus before you uh, uh, you use the lumbar puncture as a, a, a measure to uh, relieve the patient from the hydrocephalus. And it's often done in post uh, intraventricular hemorrhage hydrocephalus. In the case of choroid plexus cauterization, this may be used in cases of uh, Excessive production of CSF product, uh, or, or CSF. Yeah, what you do is that, as the name indicates, correct plexus cauterization, we uh, coagulate the correct plexus, thus reducing the production of CSF, uh, uh, of CSF by this correct plexus. So we have shunting, which is performed in most cases of hydrocephalus. 
and it is up to uh, up to 75 percent of radiopaparous patients are treated using this uh, using this method worldwide and it involves the placement of ventricular catheter into the cerebral ventricles to bypass the flow of obstruction or the malformation of the of the or the malformation and drain the excess fluid into other body cavities where it can be reabsorbed. Next slide, Dr. John. So the different shunts, the shunts drain the fluid into, so as we said, it can either place, it can either drain it into the peritoneal cavity. In this case, it's called a ventricular peritoneal shunt. You can drain it in, uh, uh, into the right atrium, which is here, it is called a ventricular, uh, ventricular arterial shunt. You can drain into the uh, pleural cavity where it is being called a uh, ventricular pleural shunt and into the gallbladder. And also uh, in the lumbar uh, peritoneal, uh, you also have lumbar peritoneal shunt by connecting the uh, uh, lumbar region to the peritoneum. So some complications and uh, those drawbacks uh, in using shunts include headaches. Patient can have headaches. We have uh, vision problems, irritability, fatigue, uh, personality change, loss of coordination, difficulty in working, um, uh, a, return of, a return of working difficulties. For example, if the patient has difficulty working, or as you say, this issue is a sign of a hydrocephalus. When treating the patient, you can have a return of all this, uh, 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 which is a complication of the, of the shunt, because if maybe there's an obstruction of the shunt, it's not going to be doing its job. So leading back to a build up of uh, CSF in the, in the ventricular system and those, continuously giving the presentation the patient came with. We also have mild dementia or incontinence. In infants, the symptoms of shunt mal uh, malfunction can include the, all of the above, as well as vomiting and the uh, inappropriate head group. And uh, of course, the sun setting, the sun setting uh, uh, eyes. So fortunately, most complications can be dealt with successfully. So if you realize there's a case of obstruction, you just have to uh, either uh, remove it and uh, redo it all over. and uh, if, uh, for example, there's a problem uh, with uh, excessive drainage of CSF, you just have to regulate the amount that you are, the amount of CSF that you are, that you are doing. So most of the complication of shunts can be managed eventually if you uh, uh, exclude uh, uh, some sort of some some kind of infection. Though we can also manage the infection. Next slide, Dr. John. So uh, the other method of uh, treating hydrocephalus is endo endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Or uh, ETV, or it can also be called endoscopic fenestration of the third ventricle. And uh, an opening in the, and it is being done how there's an opening in the uh, uh, floor of the third ventricle which is made and allows the CSF to flow directly to the basal system, thereby shortcutting any obstruction in the aqueductal stenosis. For infants, uh, this technique is sometimes combined with correct places cauterization. I already explained the uh, correct phases of cultivation uh, uh, the previous slide. Next slide, Dr. John. So let us now uh, have a, a, a word about the prognosis of hydrocephalus. Uh, the prognosis depends on the cause of the hydrocephalus, the extent of the symptoms, and the time and, and the timeliness of the diagnosis and the treatment. So it's very important to act earlier. If you would like to have a better prognosis, some patients so, show a dramatic improvement with treatment, while others do not. In some instances, the uh, of normal pressure hydrocephalus, dementia can be uh, uh, reversed by shunt placement. Other symptoms, such as headache, may disappear almost immediately if the symptoms uh, uh, are, are related to the elevated uh, elevated intracranial pressure. In general, the earlier hydrocephalus is diagnosed, the better the chance of, of, of successful treatment. Because if you allow the hydrocephalus to stay for long, there can be some uh, irreversible brain damage. So the earlier, you, the earlier you manage the patient, the better for the patient. The longer the symptoms uh, uh, have been present, the less likely it is uh, for the treatment to be successful. But unfortunately, there is no way to accurately predict how successful surgery will be for each individual. Some patients will improve dramatically, while others uh, will reach a plateau or decline after a few months. Excellent again. So, shun uh, malfunction or failure may occur also, and the value uh, and I mean, and the valve can uh, and the valve can become clogged, or the pressure in the shun may may not match the needs of the patient, requiring additional surgery. 
in the event of an infection, antibiotic uh, therapy may be a needed and likely, I mean, and likely temporary removal of the shunt and replacement by a, a drain until the infection is cleared. The shunt can be uh, can be reimplanted when uh, I mean, and when the session malformation I mean malfunction, a surgery is often needed to replace the block or malfunctioning portion of the shunt system, as we already explained. So next slide, Dr. John. Neurological function should be evaluated post-surgery. In if any neurological problem persists, rehabilitation may be required for further improvement. However, recovery may be limited by the extent of the damage already caused by the hydrocephalus and the brain's ability to heal the plasticity of the brain. So, because of because some causes of the hydrocephalus are ongoing conditions, long-term follow-up is required. And the, um, the follow-up of follow-up diagnosis takes include the CT scan, MRI, X-ray, and the, uh, and all of these are helpful in determining if the shunt is working properly beside the physical examination. So if you have physical examination of a radio patient, and the patient is not improving, then you cannot uh, 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 to be sure that is maybe due to uh, 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 any malfunction, you can request any of the tests to confirm your 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 doubt. Next slide, Dr. John. So in summary, hydrocephalus is a frequent condition and carries a high morbidity rate. Some causes of hydrocephalus has, has a, some sex and age predominant. Hydrocephalus uh, has various mechanisms responsible for its onset. Those treatment, uh, uh, treat, I mean, treatment knowing the underlying cause have to orientate on which modalities to use and the uh, which will eventually help improve the outcome of the patient. Surgical care remains the mostly used treatment modality and the best. And the prognosis will depend on the cause, the extent of the symptoms, and the timeliness of diagnosis and treatment. Studies need, studies need to be done to fine tune knowledge on hydrocephalus and care delivery to the patient with hydrocephalus. Next slide, Dr. These are my references. And uh, next slide. Thank you very much for your attention. So here we have uh, health is a human right that uh, 400 million are waiting for. So we should act for this. We should put in place measures that permit these 400 million people to have access to uh, their human rights, which is health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zolo, for another great presentation. That's a lot of work to put that together. Uh, and we'll open the panel for comments or questions. Any comments, Marco? Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, let me uh, uh, allow to tell Zulu is a great presentation, very complete, very exhaustive, uh, because he, he, uh, he got all the aspects of the hydrocephalus from the newborn hydrocephalus congenital to the adult hydrocephalus. Uh, it's not too easy to do, but it's a great job. Uh, but, uh, congratulations, Zulu. Uh, I want to just uh, uh, highlight uh, uh, about the complication of uh, 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 ventricular shunt. And I like in cases where there is uh, an infection of the ventri uh, ventricular shunt, uh, and you have the uh, diagnosis doing a tap on the valve, don't attempt any conservative uh, way. Just remove uh, the uh, shunt and put an extra ventricular drainage because uh, in this case, time is, uh, is precious. You know, I also have a comment, uh, Marco. Uh, someone wrote in from Nigeria, a Nigerian neurosurgeon whose name is Adi, Adi Kola Olomo. He's a neurosurgical resident. He asked, what antibiotics do you use to prepare the shunt hardware to, to, to avoid problems like you're talking about, infection? Well, uh, first of all, I do uh, a prophylaxis antibiotic uh, two hours before the surgery. Uh, I use uh, 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 cephalosporin, uh, use cefazolin, uh, two gram. Uh, and uh, I um, attempt to do surgery as a first case of the warning. 
because uh, uh, of course you clean the operating room after every operation, but it is obvious that the operating room is, uh, um, is cleaner uh, uh, at, the, at the first case than at the last case. That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, and, uh, another thing, uh, prepare the skin. So shave the skin of patients where you need to operate using uh, alcohol solution. Uh, I use the scrubs, the same scrubs that I used to clean my hands before surgery. Uh, and uh, um, use a, a frequent shift of your blowers. So if you start to, to, inside, to uh, uh, cut the skin, then after you expose the, the, the bone, change the glowers because of course the skin is clean it but uh, is the um, uh, the the, um, the part can be that can be more uh, contaminated by bacteria so uh, uh, cut the skin then after you expose change the glowers you your uh, helper and your uh, upper nurse of uh, uh, nurse uh, uh, in the operating room that's my uh, my way to do uh, a ventricular shunt. Okay, thank you. Hello, um, thank you, Dr. Meloni. Thank you so much. About a question, uh, um, if I can add to what Dr. Meloni said, um, I'll just send in a message right now, the link to an article that everyone can can read, especially those from low and mid income countries. This was published really recently by Professor Kalangu, who is a former vice president of the BFNS and works in Zimbabwe with other neurosurgeons in three different countries. They did a multi-centric um, study on um, shunts. Can you, can you share the screen with that? Uh, yeah, um, let, let, me get, let me get to you. Okay. So, let, let me get the original one and I'll share the screen. So, so, so they, did a, they did this study and they've explained step by step how you can get to zero shunt in a low resource setting. It's a very interesting study. Um, especially because we know that, well, ETVs are good, they're cool, but at the moment, um, not everyone can get um, um, ETVs. So we are left with our good old Shabras. Um, let me try and unlock this so everyone can see. They, they have everything with, Dr. Meloni explained it very well, uh, about how you need to prepare the skin, how you need to shave. They have everything, that, how you, you need to get your, your your cases in first in the morning. You need to limit your cases. That's why it's not a good idea to have um, these uh, campaigns during which you go to an area and then you're operating 30 kids because it's a hydrocephalus campaign. That's not a good idea. You'll get a lot of infections. So as you can see here, protocol to minimize infection. The, the, the title of the article is Towards Zero Infection. I sent the link in the message. Um, as you can see, Shunts done in the morning, neonates and infants before older patients. It's a long list. It's a really long list. And they have their, their results. A very interesting thing about this, this study is in their results, they actually found out that the primary cause of hydrocephalus was not post-meningitis hydrocephalus. It was actually third ventricle um, acuductal stenosis. So that was, that was a change because we usually thought that in our context, it was due to infection. So I invite everyone to read this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, any more comments or questions uh, from Ahmed? Uh, I don't think we met you, Ahmed. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Are you there, Ahmed? Mm, possibly not. Any comments, the win? from another student, a former a presenter later. Well, uh, I think it was a great presentation. Uh, can you get me? Yes, we got you. Yes, uh, it was a great presentation, uh, though I came in late, but uh, yeah, I think that's what I can say. It was a wonderful presentation. Okay, thank you, Dewin. Uh Okay, very good, very good, uh, uh, everyone, gentlemen because Nathalie's not here, but I'll speak to her about that. Uh, thanks everybody for coming and we'll end this presentation formally and uh, we'll start the next one. <laughs>